Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we talk with ace investigative journalist Greg Pallast of the BBC and The Guardian, who worked as an investigator on the Shoreham nuclear reactor in New York. He shares some shocking information about emergency generators installed in most every nuclear reactor in the world. It's a fasten-your-seatbelts kind of interview with this one-of-a-kind reporting powerhouse. Plus, you'll hear numbnuts of the week, the nuclear reactor duck and cover report, and more honest nuclear information than will ever make it onto the Democratic Party's national platform. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, July 12, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. Starting out in Japan this week, where in a decision that will keep the Takahama No. 3 and 4 reactors in Fukui Prefecture shut down indefinitely, the Otsu District Court ruled against Kansai Electric Power Company for the third time in five months. Both sides are now gearing up for an appeal by KEPCO to the Osaka High Court, where a decision could come next year, while the plaintiffs are expected to file further suits. In March, the Otsu Court granted a temporary injunction on the reactors, forcing KEPCO to shut them down about two months after they had been restarted. The utility filed an objection, and the court reaffirmed its decision in June, and again made the same ruling on Tuesday after KEPCO fought the June decision. When we say no, we mean no. What part of no do you not understand? The case boils down to the basic question of what determines adequate safety for a nuclear power plant and has raised questions about the way Japan's Nuclear Regulatory Authority is handling safety inspections for restarts. Last week's elections in Japan went overwhelmingly in favor of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe Baby's Liberal Democratic Party, but there were two important wins. Anti-nuclear advocate Satoshi Mitsuzonu won the Kagoshima gubernatorial race on Sunday, beating the incumbent who agreed to the resumption of reactors at the power plant in the prefecture. One of the contentious issues in the race was the fate of the Kyushu Electric Power Company's Sendai Nuclear Power Plant, which is in the prefecture. Mitsuzonu demanded that the plant operations be temporarily suspended for safety checks in the wake of a series of strong earthquakes that hit central Kyushu in April. His opponent argued that the plant's safety had been secured. And he lost. And Yohei Miyake, the young rock musician turned politician who we cited last week on Nuclear Hot Seat, won his seat in the upper house of Japan's parliament, joining Taro Yamamoto as two blatantly anti-nuclear activists in that house. Good luck. Over to the U.S., where we have to lead with the nuclear reactor duck <laughs> and cover report. Because in the last week, we've had what seems to be a record number of accidents reported to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, chief among them at the Cook Nuclear Facility in Michigan. On July 6th, an unanticipated explosion, like you're supposed to anticipate an accidental explosion, be that as it may, an unanticipated explosion created a steam leak and associated damage to the turbine building. No radiation release was reported, but the closest EPA monitor for radiation is 95 miles away in Grand Rapids, to the north and slight east, while Chicago is across the lake only 60 miles away. <coughs> on Long Island, New York, on July 5th, Indian Points Unit 2 automatically shut down while technicians were testing the nuclear reactor's electrical systems. The very systems designed to shut down the reactor, but only when they're supposed to. For the record, there have been 30 shutdowns for emergency situations reported to the NRC from 2010 to the end of 2015 at Indian Point. 
At New Jersey's Salem 2 nuclear reactor on July 11, the reactor abruptly shut down shortly after it came back in service after a generator indicated there might be a problem. Previously, the reactor automatically tripped offline on June 28 after its generator shut down because of an alarm. It was determined that rainwater had leaked through gaskets on the electrical system for the generator. Nuclear power called on account of rain. <coughs> Fitzpatrick in New York on July 8th. An oil leak forced the facility to power down 19%. <coughs> At Brunswick in North Carolina on July 5th, the high-pressure coolant injection system was declared inoperable due to a failure of an auxiliary oil pump, which prevents the system from performing its design safety function. <coughs> At the infamous Davis Bessey in Ohio on July 1st, the control room received panel alarms associated with the safety features actuation system due to a loss of supplied power. The plant did not initiate a shutdown required by technical specifications, but in retrospect should have initiated and completed a shutdown within six hours. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. Not what you want to hear around a nuke. <coughs> Are you sensing a pattern here? At Fermi in Michigan on July 8th, a severe thunderstorm warning was issued for Monroe County, which includes the Fermi 2 site. Due to the high winds encountered during the thunderstorm, the technical specifications for the secondary containment pressure boundary was not met two times during the storm. Doesn't matter that it was just for one second each time. It happened, and declaring secondary containment inoperable is reportable as an event or condition that could have prevented the fulfillment of a safety function needed to control the release of radioactive material. And that's this week's nuclear reactor duck <coughs> and cover report. But that's not the end of what happened with reactors last week in the United States, because now it's time for... Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that's out of week. Well, when safety is the issue, you can always count on the nuclear industry to be short-sighted, if not dead wrong. Three examples. Last January, a broken water hose at the Oyster Creek Nuclear Power Plant in New Jersey, only 85 miles from Manhattan, was discovered to have been about a decade older than it should have been, and that's what caused it to fail. The three-inch hose pumps water from a storage tank to cool down the plant's emergency diesel generators. The NRC reports, we found that Exelon did not have appropriate work instructions to replace the emergency diesel generation cooling flexible coupling hoses every 12 years, as specified by the company's procedures and vending information. As a result, the hose was in service for approximately 22 years and subject to thermal degradation and aging that eventually led to its failure. The Exelon-owned plant is the oldest nuclear facility in the country and will be 50 years old when the company plans to close it in 2019. I vote for an early retirement for that creaky nuclear senior citizen to put it out of its misery. Number two. Electrical relays at Massachusetts Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station, relied on to shut safety valves in the reactor building should an accident occur, had long exceeded their shelf life when checked by federal inspectors last week. They found that the relays were 22 years old, and according to the product vendors, those relays are supposed to be switched out every 10 years. So what happened? Twelve years ago, was there this secret meeting between Entergy on this part and Exelon on the other to decide that no maintenance was required on their facilities and they could just ignore it? Think of it as a car. No matter how expensive the model is that you're driving, it's going to need new hoses. It's going to need new valves. you got to do the maintenance on a regular basis. But hey, this is nuclear. Why should they be bothered about it? Number three, as of July 8th, Entergy Nuclear's Palisades Atomic Reactor in Michigan had several security workers placed on administrative leave. The reason? Fire inspection 
anomalies. What the heck does that mean? And that's the very question being asked by Kevin Camps of Beyond Nuclear. He's quoted as saying, did security guards pretend to make their rounds and not really do it and just fill out the paperwork like they had? He went on to say, if they're willing to play loose and fast and take shortcuts on that big of a risk of fire at Palisades, we're in real peril downwind. By the way, downwind includes Chicago, which is just across Lake Michigan. And that's why, Entergy and Exelon, it's a split decision so you both get to be this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of the week. At the Hanford Nuclear Reservation near Richland, Washington, the Department of Energy is making preparations to move highly radioactive sludge stored only 400 yards from the Columbia River. But even though there are known dangers from the fumes coming out of these storage tanks, which hold World War II nuclear weapons waste and much more in a toxic brew, wearing the highest criteria of protective gear, known as self-contained breathing apparatus, is optional. Dozens of workers have reported becoming sick, and now a coalition of labor unions on the Hanford site have stopped work as of Monday, July 11, at some of the radioactive waste tank farms because of health concerns. Local 598 pipe fitters, representing approximately 1,200 men and women who work at Hanford as plumbers, welders, and pipe fitters, took a stand and demanded that all of its members would wear full protective gear on every job, every day, whether or not the contractor in charge of the operations, Washington River Protection Solutions, required it. Now union leaders say that after they drew the line on safety, jobs that had historically been awarded to pipe fitters suddenly went to other trades willing to execute the tasks without wearing the protective gear. A brief international look. China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs has issued notice to its citizens warning of safety problems regarding the Fukushima nuclear leak. Hong Lei also urged Japan to explain to the world with a responsible attitude on the impact of the leak. On June 1st, Tokyo Electric Power Company admitted for the first time ever that its insistence on simply calling the tragedy nuclear reactor damage and not using the word meltdown had created five years that had hidden the truth. And Germany may not have a final storage facility for its nuclear waste up and running until the next century. Following Fukushima, Chancellor Angela Merkel announced plans to shut down all eight remaining reactors in the country by 2022. But of course, like every place else on Earth, Germany has no place to put the radioactive waste. We'll have this week's featured interview in just a moment, but first, good news. Thanks to your donations, I am halfway to what I need to attend the Excellence in Journalism Conference in New Orleans, September 17 through 20 of this year. This is where over 1,000 mainstream media reporters, news directors, on-air talent, syndicators, and the people who make the behind-the-scenes decisions as to what gets in print and on the air will be gathered at one time. Four days of lobbying for better nuclear coverage with the people who can actually provide it. Woo-hoo! My thanks to those listeners who donated specifically to help me get to this event. And thus far, I have secured my flight and paid my entry fee, which is halfway to my goal. But right now, I still have to raise the funds to book the room. And yes, while I would love to stay with a nuclear hot seat listener in New Orleans, I need to be on site in the hotel to take advantage of the up to 16 hours a day of networking opportunities with world-class journalists. So I'm asking you to help me out with a donation of any size. What you'd pay for a cup of coffee and a tip or something larger, whatever you can afford and whatever you are moved to give. Anything and everything will help me make as much noise as I can on behalf of getting us the coverage that will help us put the brakes on the nuclear menace. You can make your donations by going to NuclearHotSeat.com and clicking on the big red Donate button. That's where you can send a donation through PayPal, directly with your credit card, or if you prefer to do it the old-fashioned way, 
Email me at info at nuclearhotseat.com and I'll provide a snail mail address where you can send the check. Whatever you can do to help get me there, I am deeply grateful to you. And man, the stories are going to be fantastic. I love interviewing journalists, and my guest this week is one of the great ones. Greg Pallast is an investigative reporter whose news-breaking stories appear on BBC Television, The Guardian, Al Jazeera, and Rolling Stone magazine. He is the author of the New York Times bestsellers Billionaires and Ballot Bandits, The Best Democracy Money Can Buy, Armed Madhouse, and the highly acclaimed Vulture's Picnic, which is cited in this interview. He is best known in the United States for uncovering Katherine Harris's purge of black voters from Florida voter rolls in 2000. Greg Pallast is currently finishing the final frames of his new film on the upcoming theft of the 2016 election, The Best Democracy Money Can Buy, a tale of billionaires and ballot bandits. Fasten your seatbelts, because Greg Pallast is going to take you on quite the ride as he recounts what he learned as an investigator into what he calls nuclear racketeering. And after you hear his description of snap, crackle, and pop, you will never look at that bowl of cereal the same way ever again. Greg Pallast, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Glad to be with you, Libby. How did you get started investigating nuclear issues? I uh, was living in Chicago. I was working with uh, labor unions, including the electrical workers uh, union, the IBEW, and the utility workers. And uh, the rates the electric rates and also working with con community groups. Rates are going through the ceiling in Chicago and uh, in many cities all over the country. And poor people are getting destroyed by electric rate increases, which are all related to nuclear power. One thing that's usually forgotten in the discussion of nuclear power is that it is insanely, fabulously, not so crazy expensive and that any city or state or a utility which has touched nuclear power has seen their rates double, triple, quintuple in the case of Long Island, for example, because of the nuclear plant costs. So something which is too cheap to meter is too expensive to pay for. And that's often forgotten. So my investigations began not with the safety of nuclear plants, but with their cost. The two things are related. And I began investigating in uh, Chicago for labor unions. And then uh, when I was in uh, New York, I was ahead of the State Science and Technology Commission. I was also, and then I became a private investigator. And I worked with the uh, law firms that, and the state and city and, and federal government on racketeering cases. And basically, I uh, went after the nuclear industry because it's, um, nuclear plants are crime scenes. I don't know one that isn't built upon fraud, that isn't a danger, and that isn't fabulously expensive, and, and billions of dollars disappear through fraud, deceit, and racketeering. And, and so I helped the federal government and state government bring racket, successful racketeering charges against the industry. This is going back how far, and what was the first case that you brought racketeering charges on? Well, the first time I brought racketeering charges was right after the racketeering law was passed, RICO which was meant to uh, go after the uh, mafia. However, I found a far more dangerous group than the mafia, that is the uh, nuclear plant builders in the utility industry, because the mafia may knock out a few, uh, a few of their fellows in turf wars. Uh, the utility industry is expert at threatening the lives of millions at a, at a clip. What I found, I was working for, um, in an investigation of the Long Island Lighting Company, LOCO, which was building the Shore nuclear plant. Shoreham took 20 years to build, cost $16 billion, and ran for a single day, which was one day too many. And it was built on a foundation of fraud. And so what I discovered, I was working with the governments, and I got their inside documents showing that, and they did something that, that power companies all over America have done forever. They tell you they can build a plant for a billion in Shoreham's case, it's at a half a billion dollars. Now, I just told you that the plant cost $20 billion. Now, let's think about that. They said a half a billion dollars, and it became 20 
billion, okay? You're talking 4,000% over the projection. How did they possibly get away with this? And it didn't cost them until the very end. That is, they would constantly say, and it took 20 years, they said it could be built in five years. Every year they would say, give us a little more money and we can finish the plant next year. Give us some more money, we can finish the plant year. Give us a hundred million, give us 200 million, give us a billion, give us two billion, give us three billion, give us seven billion, give us 12 billion. Literally every year, Shoreham was one year away. So they were the laughing stock. They were considered the most incompetent managers alive. And I said, they don't sound incompetent to me. They figured out how to get billions out of the public for a power plant that doesn't exist that hasn't produced a kilowatt. The people of New York have paid literally $10 billion back in 1986, in 87, 88. By that point, the people in New York paid, and New York, uh, Long Island, paid about $10 billion toward a plant that hadn't produced a single kilowatt. So I said, they're not stupid. This looks like a crime to me. I got inside and found all the papers, paper after paper after paper, continuously, year, all the way up to the chairman of the board, the president of the company, all these characters who were saying constantly, we could have this plant finished next year for an extra billion dollars. And internally, their documents said, there is no way we can finish the plant in a year. We need two years, three years. And it's not going to be a billion dollars more. It's going to be three or four billion dollars more. And they hid that. Now, when you lie, when you lie to regulators, when you lie to the public and you do so under oath, to get rate increases and charge the public and take money from people on a lie. That's called fraud. And when you do it year after year after year, and you do it as part of a conspiracy of the top executives of the company in conspiracy with the top builders that you're working with, that's racketeering. That's what the mafia does. The difference, again, being that the nuclear industry has stolen far more money than the mafia could ever dream of and is far more dangerous than the mafia ever will be. During this time, you gained the trust of a number of whistleblowers who also alerted you to the fact that not only were there financial delays and those lies going on, but that there were also dangers involved with the way it was being constructed. Specifically, in 1986, you met with two senior nuclear engineers regarding seismic qualifications, or SQs. What were they telling you about Shoreham? Okay. SQ is a and seismic qualification is a fancy term for earthquake proofing. Every nuclear plant has to have be earthquake proofed for obvious reasons. We're talking about basically a bomb inside a tea kettle, right? <laughs> you know, it's a nuclear bomb inside a tea kettle. As we saw at Fukushima, um, it's a good idea to have earthquake proofing for your plant to make sure that the plant doesn't crack apart, fall apart, explode, melt down as in fact happened at Fukushima. Now, every plant, and that included the Fukushima plants, had to be seismically qualified, being able to take a uh, handle an earthquake. And what we found, we got inside engineers saying that the reports going to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the federal government, in which the utility itself has to sign off and say, this plant can withstand an earthquake of, of this size. And each area is a different size of earthquake you expect. In the case of the Shoreham plant, we actually were able to get the information and find the original reports written by the engineers saying, this plant cannot withstand an earthquake. This plant cannot withstand an earthquake. And the executives changed the reports of their engineers to say this plant can withstand an earthquake. Now, here's what's particularly dangerous. The Shoreham nuclear plant was no different than any other nuclear plant. The builder was at the time called Stone and Webster, which today is Shaw Construction. Stone and Webster was building half the nuclear plants on the planet. And the creator of the uh, vessel of the nuclear reactor was General Electric. General Electric knew uh, that there were problems at the Shoreham plant, but they were also the builders of, of Fukushima. Shaw Construction, which at the time is called Stone and Webster, 
was deeply involved in the lying to the regulators about the price of the plant and its safety. These problems were endemic to every, every nuclear plant. There's not a nuclear plant in America that could withstand the earthquake that they're supposed to be um, set up to respond to. Every nuclear plant in the world, in the USA and the world, including Fukushima, including every nuclear plant in America, has a target earthquake size that it should be able to withstand. Basically, the biggest earthquake that has been recorded in an area. And so it's no surprise to me when Fukushima cracked apart, melted down, exploded. Because I can tell you right now, it was a complete lie. Just like we know from the Shoreham plant, it was a complete lie because it's the same engineers, the same plans, the same builders. There is no way to build a nuclear plant for less than $100 billion, which is safe from natural disasters and from man-made disasters. It can't be done. So you have to take shortcuts. Even then, they are fabulously, insanely expensive. So in the case of the Shoreham nuclear plant, I was able to get the engineer's report saying that Shaw Construction, which right now is rebuilding Fukushima, right now building Fukushima, that Shaw Construction, its Stone Webster unit, had deliberately, deliberately lied about the earthquake proofing. Their own engineers literally wrote, this plant cannot withstand a seismic event, fancy term for an earthquake. They knew it and they lied. And they lied all over the world. If you lie in one place, you're lying everywhere. I can tell you as an investigator, as a fraud investigator. And you can read, by the way, all this stuff in my book, Vulture's Picnic. You can read about it at my website, gregpalace.com. I've been, so I spent years on this. And this one case was 10 years. Um, now, in the case of Fukushima, that plant was meant to withstand an earthquake of a shake of 550 Galileos. We use the Richter scale. That's kind of a PR number that's used on television. The earthquake specialists don't uh, use that number. These Galileos. The earthquake that hit Fukushima was well under the earthquake that they were supposed to have planned for. Now, I know that you heard Anderson Cooper in Japan saying, oh my God, they didn't expect a 9.5 earthquake to hit uh, Japan. Well, Anderson, a 9.5 earthquake didn't hit Japan. A 9.5 earthquake hit the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Think about that. In other words, when you have an earthquake, the epicenter of the earthquake, it depends how far away you are. By the time the shake hit Fukushima, it was well under a 9.5 Richter scale shake. It was well under the 550 Galileos, which is the formal measurement that, was, that the plant was supposed to withstand. So what happened? The plant managers had kept delaying and delaying and delaying earthquake proofing that plant at Fukushima. These are the same characters who built our plants in America. They're building Vogel right now. They're building Vogel right now. And, and one of the things I would note, okay, let's not forget this. A guy named Barack Obama approved building a plant the first nuclear plant in 30 years, on the south coast of Texas. Who is going to build that plant? It's, it's a Texas uh, plant, but it's going to be built by Tokyo Electric Power, the Fukushima boys. And what was the reason why Obama approved the plant? He said, well, the Department of Energy, Obama's Department of Energy and the power companies involved said, we're bringing in the guys from Tokyo Electric because they run the safest nuclear plants in the world, not like the bumblers we have in the USA, not like the bumblers they have in Russia. We're going to bring in the best guys in the world, Tokyo Electric Power. And by the way, even after Fukushima, Obama and the power companies, the power trust, were still trying to build that plant in South Texas, except the guys from Tokyo Electric because of the Japanese honor system said, we can't go ahead with this. We are not qualified to make this plant. And no one is. So that plant was done, doomed. Now we've got Westinghouse building and we have the French and others building a plant in Georgia. It's the same game. Now, the other thing that, that I found out in doing my racketeering studies and investigations, by the way, just so people know, we got a jury found the company liable for racketeering. 
and the builder of the nuclear plant, now Shaw Construction, the biggest builder in the USA, the company which is building, the company which is building the plant in Georgia is the company that a jury found to have systematically lied every single year for 12 years about the safety and cost of the plant. Now, one of the things that happened in Fukushima, they had a meltdown. Now, how could you have a meltdown even if they didn't do their proper earthquake proofing? There should have been no meltdown, no destruction, if your emergency diesel generators ran. Because the whole thing about nuclear plants, you have to keep cold water running over those hot nuclear rods. And so what we use is, is, is plants in the U.S. all have two, three, four emergency diesel generators. It sounds great. These things are huge. These things are like, you know, like three, the size of two train cars put together. I mean, it's, they're big. They look like locomotives and they make a lot of noise. You turn them on and you think, man, if something went wrong, you snap those things on and they'll save us. They'll keep the water flowing. Forget it. You might as well put Christmas decorations around the nuclear plant, they'd be just as effective as the so-called emergency diesel generators. How do I know this? Well, first of all, every time they've been tested in emergency, they have failed. Not sometimes, every time. And at Fukushima, not only did every diesel generator at Fukushima fail, but because they wanted to shut down, they had to shut down nuclear plants all over the country. Some that had to be scrammed immediately, they snapped on their diesel generators, and diesel generators failed all up and down Japan, not just at Fukushima. Now, here's the lie that they tell you at Fukushima. Oh, there was a tsunami, and it flooded the diesel generators. Well, I have the satellite photos. The tsunami never touched the diesel generators, my friends. They never got there. Take a look at the satellite photos. The diesel generators were on a hill above the plant in case of a tsunami, okay? Why didn't they work? Because they can't. These are diesel generators usually taken, literally taken from old cruise ships. There are a few new ones. They're, almost all of them are made by a company called Transamerica de Laval. Transamerica de Laval faked, and this is part of a racketeering case, I put this material in front of a jury, faked the tests on these emergency diesel generators. Because here's what you have to do. According to the engineers, when there's a nuclear plant accident and it loses power and it cannot keep pushing water over those hot rods, the emergency diesel generators are supposed to snap on within 12 seconds. They are supposed to go to twice their rated speed of RPM, thousands of revolutions per minute. So they have to go from cold zero to double power within 12 seconds. And let me tell you something. Have you ever seen a cruise ship leave dock at 400 miles per hour? No. They, they turn on the engines. They let the oil run through the engine. It's just like, these are like old cars that you used to have to warm up for 20 minutes. You have to let them warm up for hours, let the oil lubricant run through and slowly ramp them up. If you suddenly turn on, in fact, you'd probably do it with your even today's cars. And don't use the car for two months, then suddenly turn on the key and try to rev it to 120 miles an hour, you'll blow the crankshaft. You'll blow that, you'll blow that system out. And that's exactly what happens. What happened at the Shorm nuclear plant, we tested this just to prove our point. We knew, we knew that these diesel generators at Fukushima, remember the ones at Fukushima, at Shorm, and at the nuclear plant near you have the same exact diesel generators in case of an emergency. So this is all about you if you're listening to it. It's not about Japan and it's not about New York. It's about you. And so what happens is that they faked the test and we got on a witness stand under oath the engineers to say, yes, we faked the test. That when we were told to run the, the generators for uh, 24 hours, we ran them for an hour. And they said run them at 20,000 RPM, we'd run them at 2,000 RPM. They never really tested those engines. They'd warmed them up illegally before the test, basically as if they were given the test answers before they took the test. So then the state of New York made Shaw Engineering and made Long Island Lighting run the test with inspectors standing at the generators, watching the test. Now they had to be watched by the teachers when they took the test. And there were three generators, and now they are known as Snap, Crackle, and Pop. The first one 
blew apart in one hour. The second one took about two hours. And the third one took about three hours. Snap, crackle, and pop. All three emergency diesel generators snap, crackle, and pop as soon as they had a test at actual emergency conditions. And let me tell you, they weren't the worst generators. None of the generators, they're all the same worldwide, simply cannot snap on at the time. The only way that they would work, my friends, is if you kept them running at full power all the time. And, of course, if you did that, why do you have the nuclear plant? You have three giant generators. Might as well run them to power your homes. So this is the insanity of nuclear power. It is a threat to your lives. And I'm telling you this because I'm not, I was never, never, never an anti-nuclear guy. I'm not a Luddite. I'm not a tree hugger. I'm talking to you as an expert investigator who's investigated these plants all over the world. There's not one that's safe because they cost billions of dollars and there isn't a single company that wouldn't go bankrupt if they had to pay the cost of keeping these plants safe. So this is not about whether nuclear plants can be safe. This is the fact that they aren't safe for that reason. It costs too damn much. And when we caught Long Island Lighting and we caught Shaw Engineering lying, they were hit with a four and a half billion dollar judgment by a jury. Four and a half billion dollar judgment by the jury that I brought the case to. Four and a half billion. The governor stepped in to save the company and a settlement was reached where they had to do three things. Instead of paying four billion, because they didn't have that, they paid four hundred million. They were put into bankruptcy and they had to shut down the power plant. It had only run one day. But thank God, and it only ran at fractional power for a single day. Thank God, because my family lived within 20 miles of that plant. And that's the lie of nuclear power. It's run by racketeers, and now it's a shame. I can tell you right now, the president, the president of the company that was found guilty of racketeering, this massive criminal conspiracy by the federal government, by the federal government and a jury. The president of that company became the chief advisor to the Republican candidates on nuclear power. And the company which was building the plant and found guilty of racketeering, Stone and Webster, simply changed its name and was bought out by Shaw Engineering, which is back in the nuclear business. And so, see, corporations, they're shapeshifters. They're immortal. Radiation doesn't kill them. They can live forever. They just change their corporate name. They go into bankruptcy. They come out. This is the Donald Trump industry. It's endless companies going bankrupt and coming back out of the grave to scare you and return alive. So, you know, bankruptcy is like one of the, one of the special ingredients of nuclear power because it also lets them off the hook on their obligation. And you, dear customer, pay. The people of New York have paid billions and billions for that plant and got one day of power. And they were lucky it only ran for one day. We see it all over. I just passed by, the day before yesterday, I went by the San Onofre nuclear plants built on a fault line. Okay? This is endemic to the industry. This is endemic to the industry. And I want to emphasize it's not just safety. It's cost. you got engineers who believe in the industry, who want to build plants that are safe, and they are fired. Whistleblowers are, are hunted down, fired, harassed destroyed, ruined. It's absolutely ugly. I read these. If you look in Vulture's Picnic, you can actually see the notebooks of the engineers. They keep daily logs. Every engineer in America keeps a daily log of their work. And these guys just saying, this work isn't done. This isn't safe. This isn't nuclear qualified. This is not earthquake proof. If you want to have some scary bedtime reading, you really forget Stephen King. Read the engineer's notebooks from nuclear plants. That'll keep you awake. One of the things that's so astonishing when you look at the money around these things is that as the public, I mean, they've got the money rigged. They get loan guarantees to build them. They keep the profits while they're operating them. They get subsidies to decommission them. Then under Price Anderson, there's a cap of $12.6 billion should anything go wrong with any of them in total. And after that, it's on the public. And Fukushima is now at $15 billion and going to go way beyond that. And governments are responsible for the radioactive waste forever. How in the world is it 
the racketeering? Is it psychosis? How have they been able to get away with this? And is there anything we can do to derail this system? What they have is your money. So, for example, Barack Obama made fun of John McCain for calling for building nuclear plants and giving public guarantees for the building of nuclear plants. Basically a bailout in advance for new nuclear plants. And Obama slammed McCain's position. Within months of becoming president, he reversed himself and secretly created a fund of over $50 billion to guarantee the finances of new nuclear plants. And you know what he did? He stuck it. You'll love this. He stuck this $50 billion guarantee for the nuclear industry inside the emergency package for armor for our troops in Afghanistan and Iraq. And he said, the Republicans better not stop me from uh, giving armor and uh, bulletproof vests and armoring our Humvees in war zones. That was nothing. That was fluff. That was a couple billion meaningless bucks. Underneath it all was a secret $50 billion guarantee for the nuclear industry. You tell me what that has to do with saving our troops in Iraq. That's what Obama did, okay? Now, why would he do that? The answer is David Axelrod, okay? The guy that got him elected, his campaign chief, Axelrod, moved in with him to the White House, said, oh, Barack, we have a couple bills left over from the campaign. That is, we owe Commonwealth Edison of Chicago, the local power company that backed Obama and had hired David Axelrod to be their mouthpiece. See, Axelrod didn't make his money by working for Obama. He made his money by working for the power industry. Commonwealth Edison with Entergy is the biggest nuclear um, operator in the nation. And on the other hand, what about uh, we had Senator Hillary Clinton, whose client was Middle South Companies, now known as Entergy, So she was a lawyer for the nuclear industry. And as a senator, as a senator, Hillary Clinton at first refused to call for the shutdown of the dangerous Indian Point nuclear plant, which is just outside New York City. Imagine if you had a Fukushima event at Indian Point, New York City would be abandoned for the next 300 years. That's no joke. They talk about global warming. How about instant frying? from a nuclear plant right outside New York City. What she didn't declare is that Indian Point was purchased by Entergy, her client, her client. She didn't recuse herself from that discussion. Then later she realized that she wanted to run for president, that she was going to run into trouble. So she so she switched her position, calling for the closing of that nuclear plant. Thank God. Now, this is the problem. They they own the politicians. They've got the money. They've got your money. And also they got the banks because nuclear plants are basically just total cash cows for banks. You can imagine these companies are borrowing tens of billions of dollars. Where else do you get customers like that? Tens of billion dollars. It's not their own money. It's paid for by the public. The public, you have captive customers, electric customers. There's no such thing as a free market in electricity. You got to have your electricity. You don't get a choice, right? You're stuck with paying for that plant. You pay the utilities, but basically they're just a pass-through operation to the big banks. And that is what's really behind the nuclear industry, is the big bank industry. And why did Obama create guarantees for the the nuclear industry? Because it's guarantees for the banking industry. If the banking industry is going to put up money for these nuclear plants and make a killing, the public had to be on the hook. You can't bail out the banks on one hand on their bad mortgages and not bail them out for their bad nuclear deals. So you had to quietly basically set up the bailout fund in advance. Greg, you obviously have insight and depth and understanding of this issue beyond what most mere mortals can come up with. Are you working specifically on any nuclear stories right now? I am trying to put aside nuclear stories right now because, one, I'm hoping that America comes to its senses and we don't start back on the nuclear path. We have one plant in construction that Obama approved after saying he would never do such a thing with government guarantees, which he said he would never approve. He did it anyway. Look, these things never really get built. Most nuclear plant projects in the U.S. get started. They spend billions and billions. They shut them down. 
I think we're going to head in that direction. It'll probably be shut down. Most experts I speak to say it's another boondoggle. So you, Mr. and Mrs. Taxpayer, and you, the ratepayers of Georgia, are going to pay a lot of money for plant, which will probably never be built. Thank God. It's dangerous. You don't want it. They haven't changed the the bad designs. They're still they're still using these emergency diesel generators, uh, which they have been proven at Fukushima and everywhere else don't work. We have the reports. We have the tests. They don't work, and they still say, "Don't worry, we've got emergency diesel generators." These old cruise ship engines. You know, to me, it's like you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So let's not be shamed again. Let let's you know. I hope that this one nuclear idiocy in Georgia is going to be uh, terminated and we won't need any further discussion. Right now, I am, of course, working mainly. I'm about to release a film based on my book, The Best Democracy Money Can Buy, on the theft of the upcoming election and all the trickery involved in stealing those elections. Because, you know, it's a funny, nuclear energy got me into studying you know, its main component of a nuclear plant is not cement and it's not steel. The main component of a nuclear plant is political influence. So I began to study the influence of money on politicians, starting with the nuclear industry and the way that the nuclear industry has captured all parties in every nation, whether it's Britain, Japan, the United States. The money influence of the nuclear industry is beyond compare, again, because it's money that ultimately ends up with the banks. From that, when I saw the money that was going into the Bush family, for example, Enron, money going into the George W. Bush campaign, and money from the power companies and the Wiley brothers who were big investors in the utilities and the power companies in Texas, that led me to follow the money in going to the Bush family. And following the money into the Bush family led me to find the companies that were manipulating the voter rolls and, and purging black people off the voter rolls. I literally started my investigations of vote theft in America by following the money from the nuclear industry and the banks into the Bush political machine. And from the Bush political machine, that led me to the money being used. Where are they using the money? They were using the money because they couldn't win elections to steal elections by manipulating the voter rolls. So it actually started as an investigation of the uh, power industry. Greg, if there is anything that comes up again about nuclear, if you'd be willing to speak with us again about your insights, there's so much more in all of this. I would welcome you at any time on the show, and you will always have a platform with us. Well, thank you, and bless you for keeping this issue alive, because these... I thought these zombies would never come out of the crypt, and here they are in Georgia. I thought that they would never return in Japan, and they're rebuilding in Japan. It's a wonderful racket. And the funny thing is, the more these guys screw up, the more money they make. Mm -hmm. They have an incentive to be a disaster. And then look at Shaw Engineering. Okay, so Fukushima blows up. Instead of arresting these guys, they give them a billion-dollar contract to cart away the junk, and then a multi-billion-dollar contract to, whoops, they'll probably rebuild it. They suffer no penalty by screwing up. I mean, the one case we brought, the ra- that racketeering case, put Lilco out of business. Stone and Webster, unfortunately, got away with paying a few dollar fine. Yeah, they ended up in trouble. They had to change their name and all that stuff. But, you know, here they are. So bless you for reminding people that this beast, this body is not dead. And what you have to do is put a spike of information through its heart. I had a whole team on this. I had dozens of people working for me on these investigations worldwide. And it's a frightening industry. And I, I thought we had killed the beast, but it doesn't seem to be happening. Uh, very, very dangerous stuff. But also, it's a real danger to your pocketbook. I mean, the ruinous, ruinous costs in communities. And, you know, I listened to these power company executives when I talked about when you raise these prices and you cause unemployment, the, the mass poverty, I related to poverty in New Orleans, for example, fighting Hillary Clinton's power company. I was working for the city of New Orleans, investigating Hillary Clinton's company, which is just a cesspool of corruption and danger. These companies they just laugh. They literally, I'm not saying that they chuckle, they laugh out loud when you talk about the economic devastation to communities with the cost of these nuclear plants. So I'm glad you're keeping it up. We'll keep it going. Go to gregpalace.com if you want more reports. And also don't uh, fail to uh, catch the film coming out, The Best Democracy Money Can Buy. We'll keep you posted. It will be 
um, previewed at Netroots on July 16, and then it will be premiered with its uh, grand national opening in, in uh, September before the election. The best democracy money can buy a tale of billionaires and ballot bandits. And, <laughs> and it's hard to imagine, given what I've told you, that there are things almost as bad as the nuclear industry out there. Well, Greg, we can trust you to give us the real information on this with depth, clarity, complexity, and a great sense of humor and style all at the same time. Thank you so much for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thanks, Libby. Investigative journalist Greg Pallast. You can follow Greg's work at gregpallast.com. That's G R E G. P like Peter, A L A S T dot com. And keep your eyes open for his soon to premiere movie, The Best Democracy Money Can Buy A Tale of Billionaires and Ballot Bandits. One follow up point to our interview Hillary Clinton has not called for the closure of Indian Point nuclear reactors. In the most recent reference I could find, as of April 7, 2016, she only called for more oversight. Oversight, of course, is a word that has two equal and contradictory meanings. Overseeing, as in managing, and overlooking, as in ignoring. I'll leave it to you to figure out which one Ms. Rodham Clinton meant. Activist shout out! Comments are needed at the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, by July 25th on their insane proposal to increase the allowable radiation in drinking water by up to 1,000 times higher than is allowed now. And even that's too much. We will have a link up on the website to where you can let them know, let the EPA know what it is you think of this idiocy. And let the Department of Energy, the DOE, know by July 31st that you do not consent to consent-based siting of radioactive waste dumps and mobile Chernobyls. We'll have a link up to Kevin Camp's great talking points on exactly what's wrong with their proposal, as well as how to contact the DOE to comment. And please comment. It really does count. Both of these links will be on NuclearHotSeat.com under this episode Number 264. Here's today's final thought. Those of us who oppose nuclear often have other interests that we're passionate about that put us on the front lines of activism. In light of the difficulties and horrors of the past week, I have to acknowledge Malcolm Chaddock, one of the regular nuclear hot seat listeners and supporters. Malcolm was participating in a peaceful Black Lives Matter demonstration in Portland, Oregon, when a man pulled a loaded gun on the demonstrators. Malcolm happened to be right in what threatened to be the line of fire, no more than 15 away from that loaded gun and looking down the barrel. Yes, he's the one in that picture, facing the potential shooter, hands up, trying to talk the man down from doing something horrific on what should have been a quiet street corner. Malcolm wasn't the only one to intercede. Others helped stabilize the situation until the police could neutralize it completely. Still, when one looks at that picture, you can see the hair's breadth, the whisper of whatever it was that separated what ultimately came down from the tragedy it could have been. Life is fragile. Some of us face the reality of death by idiots on a daily, immediate basis, assaulted by prejudice, racism, hate of one description or another, all of it deadly. And all of us face death by idiots on a nuclear basis, be it the short-term blast of a deployed weapon the meltdown of machinery that plumes radiation into the environment, the release of deployed uranium in some foreign land, or the long-term poisoning of our futures as radionuclides bombard our DNA. Sometimes we can see and know what we're facing. Other times it's stealthy, invisible. But that doesn't mean it isn't there. 
Earth is a rock in the middle of a bubble, in the middle of nowhere. What happens on Earth stays on Earth. We are all in this one together. It's been a tough week. So be gentle with yourselves. Do something to nourish your hearts, your minds, your bodies. We who love life, who fight the good fight against nuclear and other assaults upon our lives and take stands on issues, need to sustain ourselves and help each other so that we can continue the peaceful fight, the many peaceful fights, to impose sanity on a world gone mad. For whatever stability your energy, your presence, your words conveyed to that angry, fearful man pointing the gun, thank you, Malcolm Chaddock. Thank you. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, July 12, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from tri-cityherald.com, comonews.com, king5.com, and ace reporter Susanna Frame, pressofatlanticcity.com, capecodtimes.com, beyondnuclear.org, wwmt.com, mtexpress.com, artvoice.co, whip dot energy dot gov abc seven dot co fukuleaks dot org japan times dot co dot jp asahi dot com deunrenard dot wordpress dot com santa fe new mexican dot com the nuclear regulatory commission and the ever vigilant life loving activists who gather at nuclear hot seat on facebook where you are all invited to join us and like us theme music written by me sung by Marilee weber Accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV, ActivateMedia.org, PlanetExperts.com, on NewsZSentinel.com, and now broadcast on WGRN-FM in Columbus, Ohio. We're always looking for other stations and networks to connect with, so if you know of an online news aggregator or community radio station that would like to carry the show, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. You can check out the archive of over 260 shows on the website, on our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, or on iTunes under Podcasts. If you sign up on the website to receive notice and a link to each week's Nuclear Hot Seat episode, as a bonus, you will receive a chapter from my ebook, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, One Mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and Beyond. The full book is available on Amazon and will be updated and published as a book book this year. And a reminder that your contributions help keep Nuclear Hot Seat the vital force it is for honest, accurate nuclear news. So please do what you can this week to help out with a donation at NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that Nuclear Hot Seat is now downloaded every month in 112 countries. We are not alone with our concerns, and the activists are linking because we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. So don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the Nuclear Hot Seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb.